my definition of mental health is really do we have the optimal conditions for us to grow in a healthy way? So if I think about a flower, right, does it have the soil that's nourished, right, for it to grow as good as it can grow? Does it have the water? Does it have the light? Does it have all the different elements for it to be the healthiest flower that it can be? If not, then we might not have a flower, right, or it might not even bloom. A growing concern about mental health treatment in Latino communities. People were calling the mental health crisis the second pandemic. When I would get home from work every day, I would go to, I had a TV room in the back, and I would just go sit there and close the door, and I would just sit there for hours. And my daughter's concerned, and she said, I'm afraid my dad's going to kill himself. So, I sought help. Panel of experts now saying all kids as young as eight should be screened for anxiety. Research shows that traumatic childhood experiences can have a lifelong impact. We had a suicide come into the hospital and I was the nurse on that day and he was my patient. I just watched a child die and I watched his mother pleading over him and I watched his brother reading a letter to him and now I have my own suicide. So that's why I became vocal after Trevor's. I wasn't going to be bullied by the stigma of suicide. I'm one person. I wish I had the magic answer. I wish I could go in there and just every day tell everybody everything I've learned as a survivor and it's still never going to be enough. I don't know how we get there. Mental health can mean different things to different people, from needing a break due to burnout to more serious mental health illnesses like schizophrenia. There is a wide range of people needing help. In fact, nearly one in seven California adults experiences a mental illness, and one in 14 children face an emotional disturbance, and it's only getting worse. Californians experiencing serious psychological distress doubled from 2015 to 2021, with the San Joaquin Valley among the highest percentage at nearly 21%. How did we get here? To better understand where mental health in California needs to go, we need to understand where it's been. My name is Michelle Cabrera and I'm the Executive Director of the County Behavioral Health Directors Association. The first state hospital that was opened in California was in Stockton in 1851. The idea behind state hospitals at that time was to create kind of an all-inclusive place for people with mental illness to live. Typically they were out in rural areas, they might have had farm land, and people were supposed to have kind of a whole community there, holistic kind of living environment. That ideal fell apart pretty quickly because the population surged and soon there were many more people than they had staff or resources to support. Fast forward 100 years to the 1950s, where the first antipsychotic medication was brought to market, called Thorazine. It showed great promise in helping those with severe mental illnesses. And it was this medical breakthrough that fueled a wave of federal and state reforms that began the deinstitutionalization movement. Deinstitutionalization was really about the idea that with medication, um, people with mental illness could live safely in communities. We introduced deinstitutionalization laws at the state level, starting with the Short Doyle Act, the, which really introduced community mental health concepts in California. In 1968, in California, we passed the Lantern and Petra Short Act, which required that people had to go through certain court processes in order to compel people to have mental health treatment and really meant to address some of the abuses of the time. What followed was a series of funding and defunding of mental health services, 
leading counties responsible for delivering mental health programs to those under the publicly funded Medi-Cal and everyone else left to figure out the confusing network of private insurance. Over 170 years later, there is still much more work to do. And now experts are sounding the alarm. one very special woman to CCWC today, a woman who knows a bit about resilience, and she's here to celebrate all that we are. ABC News Chief Health and Medical Correspondent, Dr. Jennifer Ashton. I would like to ask everyone here, just for a show of hands, if you've ever had an experience in your life where you thought, I don't know if I'm gonna get through this. <laughs> Almost everyone. Well, I think the state right now of mental health in this country is in critical condition. The fact of the matter is, is that we've seen sky-high visits to pediatric emergency rooms for psychiatric emergencies. And we know that a considerable number of adults on any given day are suffering from anxiety, depression, a combination of both, and or a significant psychiatric diagnosis. Well, we're starting to see a lot of adults who are coming back to the workplace and their mental health really is, is at question. And maybe they're feeling depressed, they're feeling lonely, and because our society has usually labeled people or given people diagnoses, I think a lot of times people are, are hesitant to go out and, and maybe get some help. Why are people having a hard time finding providers? Demand exceeds supply by a lot. One of the biggest obstacles many are facing is access to care. The San Joaquin Valley leads California with the most people with mental health issues. But when you look at the number of providers, the Valley has the least, with Madera County alone having one provider for every 2,100 patients. We don't have a lot of providers. We don't have a lot of psychiatrists. We don't have a lot of therapists. We don't have enough people to be providing the services that are needed in our community right now. People are on wait lists for two, three, four months to get in to see a therapist or a psychiatrist. And so what happens is if I had mild depression and I need to go see a therapist or I need to maybe get some meds and I'm hanging on and I'm on this wait list for multiple months and then life just keeps happening and throwing curveballs at me and my depression keeps getting worse, that pushes me into a state of crisis. If I can't get the mental health services that I need in order to treat my mild depression, then maybe it becomes moderate or even becomes severe as I start to lose hope or as my condition starts to get worse. Access to care changed during COVID for mental health patients. One, there was a greater demand for services. People were experiencing mental health conditions more often than they had pre-COVID. But one of the things that happened in this area is that private practice became a much more attractive situation for a lot of therapists. Primarily getting reimbursed by insurance plans for those services moved to a cash pay only option. If you can wait two to four months and then pay anywhere between 100 to $185 per week for therapy, it, it just, it's not a good situation for access to care. It has other effects on the rest of the community. If we don't have programs that fill in this continuum of care, fill in this gap, then it pushes them straight into the hospital. As a nurse, it's very disappointing. Our hospital system is overwhelmed. This problem is huge. It doesn't fall on one hospital, and it doesn't necessarily fall into one nurse, but we become numb to it. You know, mental health patients get told, like, just stop faking, or just get over it, or just stop acting out, because unfortunately they're seen as a problem in the ER. The kids are just having a bad day. Oh, they're just brats. Oh, these kids, they're just, they're acting out. You know, if we have a heart attack, we're on it. If we see a stroke, we see it, right? On the heart attack, we see your EKG, we can tell, but we can't see inside the brain. And so if you're any age and you're having suicidal thoughts, what we do is we take you into a secured area and you're sat there until somebody can come and talk to you. And that can be hours. Days. It can be hours or days before somebody can come and talk to you. A lot of the providers in emergency rooms don't have training in mental health, so they aren't always the best at providing therapeutic interventions. And that's understandable. They're there to practice medicine. 
So if they're there to keep people alive, like that's what people are going to the emergency room for. And the third leading cause of death in adolescence is suicide. Like treat that mental health patient well so that they don't die. So I was very public and open with the fact that uh, in 2017, uh, my ex-husband as of two weeks and the father of my children died by suicide. When you ask the question of how did we get here, we have to take responsibility. And so when you ask yourself, how did I get here? I think unfortunately, it comes from a place of not being able to talk freely and openly about our mental health and mental struggles from how we were raised to how we were educated to how our society is and it we're behind so it's never too late to catch up and it's never too late to have this discussion we all have to recognize that we all played roles in getting us here and now we have to pivot and really make up for lost time I started really running um, since 2012. And I started doing 5Ks and 10Ks. And in 2015, I finally did my first half marathon. It was a California Classic in uh, Fresno. After every race, I would first thing I would do, I would call my dad. He would always encourage me, he goes, hey, you're doing good. You know, physical fitness is good. Two weeks later, um, I lost my, my parents to murder-suicide. Mental health can be a difficult topic to discuss. While younger generations are normalizing the conversation, the stigma around mental health is still very strong. Whether it's cultural, generational, or just fear of the unknown, many are not receiving the help they need. In 2019, nearly two-thirds of adults with a mental illness did not receive mental health services. How do we end the stigma surrounding mental health? Sometimes it takes the tragedy of others to break the cycle. Okay, Tony. Well, the Blue Angels first started flying after World War II, and they are essentially goodwill ambassadors designed to spread the word about naval aviation. They will use the sky and wind as a kind of trampoline. Flying at 700 miles per hour, wings just 18 inches apart. My name is uh, Victor Melendez, and I'm a retired Master Chief from the Navy. The biggest memories that I feel accomplishments was being part of the Blue Angels. This was on uh, May 12th mm -hmm. of uh, 1999. Uh, Diane Sawyer came to the squadron. Mm -hmm. She was getting a VIP flight. We were actually inside the hangar in a in a room and I was briefing her for what you what to expect, uh -huh. what to do in the flight. A dizzying a blast of instructions. Armament, your fist above your helmet. Gray Which knob. knobs to touch? Any gray knobs in the cockpit are okay to touch. Black and yellow are off limits. My mom called me crying because, you know, she saw me on TV with, with Diane Sawyer. Yeah. It was it was cool. haven't identified the husband and wife found dead at this dual residence. Police are using this murder-suicide to send a strong message home. I got a text from a high school friend. My parents' houses were roped off with caution tape. The police were there, and she called my sister and told her, hey, something's going on at your parents' houses. And they showed up and found out that my parents were dead. I was in shock. A shock hit me right away. I was actually uh, leaning up against the wall standing and I actually fell down to the ground. Um, I was in disbelief. Uh, I had just spoken to my dad the day before and I thought we had one of the best conversations ever. 
I miss my mom's cooking. I miss my dad's talks. And they're gone. They're gone and I'm never going to get it back. You know, it's a huge void that no one can fill. The days that led after that, I flew to El Paso. Um, I had to deal with the police department. I had to witness uh, where my parents died. Silhouettes, they do that, all that. Blood. Witnessing all that just destroyed me. Everything that I had done to close out that estate and I had not really grieved. My command master chief, really good friend of mine, uh, he gave me a post-it and it had a name, Justin Thomas. He was the director of fleet and family support at the base. And I chose to take it. Uh, after what I had to experience and see, I was broken. Taking that note and making that first meeting is a lifesaver. One of the challenges with, with stigma reduction is, is you do have to try to tailor it to various communities because the various communities and cultures have different ways that they're perceiving you know, mental health. A lot of it has to do with fear and the fear comes from the unknown. Trying to peel back layers of years, people thinking like, well, if I say I have a mental health condition, they're gonna put me in an insane asylum. If, if I'm undocumented, if I say I have a mental health condition, are they gonna deport me? If I say I have a mental health condition, does this mean I'm not gonna get my kids back? And so we're now trying to peel back those layers. It's definitely had a huge shift to where now people are asking for and expecting those services versus before no one would sit in front of a crowded room and raise their hand and say, where are the mental health services? because uh, they did not want the eyes on them. Now it's like, where are the mental health services for our kids? And then five more parents stand up like, yeah, where, where are those services? So it's been that, you know, we finally maybe came to the conclusion that we really need those services, that they're not a bad thing, that they really can help our children, our families, our communities. And so the more we start to reduce the stigma, and the more we start to talk about mental health, and the more we normalize mental health, th those words will carry less weight. There was one day, my, at the time my daughter was 13, I was taking her constantly, too. The week before, my daughter says, Dad, are you going to go see Justin on Sunday, on Monday? I'm like, yes, I am, yeah, I am. She goes, do you think I can go? And I'm like, are you I said, don't you have your own counselor? She goes, yeah, but I want to go with you. I said, OK, let me call Justin. And I did. Justin said, well, Linda, how are you? What's going on? And she said, I'm afraid my dad's going to kill himself. Do what grandpa did. That was the hardest thing to hear from my daughter. Me as a son, I've suffered a lot with my parents' deaths. And I was like, there's no way I would do that to my daughter or my son. That was a commencement of my retirement ceremony. How emotional were you that day? Very. Was it? It was hard, not yeah. having my parents. Mm. That was hard because that's the reason I didn't want to do it. Uh, I didn't want to do the retirement because my parents weren't going to be there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was convinced. At my retirement ceremony, I said, you know, the resources are there. Don't suffer in silence. There's nothing wrong. It's okay to go get help. It doesn't make you a weak person. The people that we're treating every day are your friends, are your coworkers, are the people that you go to church with, are the people on your kids' soccer team, these are 
people in everyday life that are having struggles that they're having a hard time with and they need some extra help. This is everybody. This is everywhere. We are still at a point where we need to address stigma. It's not gone, but it is improving, especially with the younger generation talking about mental health a lot more. It's bringing the conversation into light and into everyday uh, relationships. And there's still a lot of uh, phrases or terminology or vocabulary used that further stigmatizes mental health conditions, like calling people crazy or insane, things like that, that are just part of daily vocabulary for some people that further stigmatize people with mental health. It, it, it ostracizes them, it pushes them away as different or other than, and then people don't have a natural curiosity to what might be going on for that person. And I think that would go a long way in our uh, society is to teach ourselves and teach our kids to be curious about other people instead of judging or labeling them. You have to look out for yourself, take responsibility for yourself. Because if you don't do it, then it's going to be harder for you later on. So people need to take pause and, and realize that we need to talk about this more. You know, they can't make it. There's such a stigma about mental health, especially men. You know, when I was going to mental health in Lemoore at the base, it was mostly junior sailors, pretty much. And then they'd see me walk in and they were like giving me looks like, there's a master chief here. And then they would call me to the back, you know, to go see my psychologist. I think that made them, I don't know if it, it made them like, okay, it's okay to be here. Mm -hmm. And it is okay to be there. Yeah, yeah that's important mm -hmm. because it is tough, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm already retired, but I would have done this interview too if I was active duty because this is, that's how important it is to me. And like I said, every chance, every opportunity I get to talk about it, I will talk about it. How do you feel? Sad that your Niners lost yeah, today. Yeah, we should have won that game. <laughs> what would Trev tell you? Suck it up, Ange. I almost wore his, uh, he has his jerseys. Yeah. I almost wore them, but sometimes it's hard. Nobody hugged like Trevor. When Trev hugged you, he felt like if you were having a bad day, his hug would take everything out of you. Like, you were his buddy. He didn't care how it looked for two guys to hug. Like, you're my buddy, come over here and give me a hug, you know? And when his friend dropped him off at home, he, he said, hey dude, I'll see you around. The kid talking to him, his best friend said, hey dude, I'll see you around. And Trev turns around, he's like, what are you talking about, dude? I'll see you tomorrow. You know, like he was just always forward, always thinking up. This is two hours before he died. When my son said, I would never leave you, I trusted my son. That was the one day he let me down. I love him no less. The mental health of our kids continues to be a growing problem, even before the COVID-19 pandemic. In CDC surveys of high school students across the U.S., 37% in 2019 said they experienced feelings of sadness and hopelessness. That number grew to 44% in 2021, a 70% increase from 2009. Even more alarming is that nearly 20% of those students seriously considered suicide, and 9% had attempted it. What's a parent to do? Ask anyone who has dealt with the unthinkable. They'll tell you, speak up. This one's really important to me because I feel like we need people to tell. And because he told and they didn't tell anybody, I was really trying to stress, like, tell someone. If they tell you, that's a big responsibility that I don't want you to hold on your own, especially if you're a kid. And a kid goes to another kid. I don't want the other kid feeling like that responsibility is in their hands. So go get help. Right. 
Trevor is an amazing kid, really full of life, one of the biggest hearts you'll ever find. Always had a smile on his face, always that person who like would see somebody by themselves or sitting in a corner and he would go and befriend you if he saw you sad or down, like he wanted to pick you up. And uh, you know, when people talked after the funeral, all the kids that went up and spoke and there was a ton, the outpouring of love for him was incredible. You can have one or two people tell you something. This was hundreds, hundreds. Literally, every single one of them talked about his character and his hugs. We do hug like Trevor uh, to save lives and to tell kids that they matter and to come and- I knew the home life that Trevor had. Trev was very blessed. So immediately I thought, if Trev could feel unloved in the situation and the environment that he came from, what about the kids who don't have it? What about the kids who do struggle? What about the ones who were abused? What about all the untold stories that we don't know about and the ones who don't go home and don't have food to eat? And so when we went out there, I was handing out water bottles and muffins. Maybe they just need somebody to see that this stranger is up here and there's like somebody that I don't know, but she cares that I had something in my stomach and I wanted nothing from them. I wanted nothing back because we always want something, right? To give something, we have to get something. But here I am, I'm just giving it to you just to say good morning have this and they were shocked like why are, and a lot of the first questions were like why why are you doing this for me why why would you give me that i just want you to have a good day i want you to know that somebody out there thought about you today and i don't even know your name but i'm so glad that you're here would you guys like a bracelet hug like trevor tell somebody that they matter this was my way of saving lives dozens of kids got out of their car in a two-year period of time i wasn't coming to school today i was waiting for my mom to go home to work. Something said, go to school. And I saw your sign. I was going to kill myself. And I saw your sign. So every Friday, I kept holding up a sign. In 2017, um, two weeks after a very amicable divorce. My ex-husband and the father of my children died by suicide. And it was a very public story. But nevertheless, it was one that my children and I felt very strongly about not being silent about. And it was really my children's idea and calling to not hide this, not whisper about it, not keep it a secret. Uh, and not sweep it under the rug because uh, they both felt that I had an opportunity and a responsibility to use the platform that I have at ABC and in national media to talk about something that affects approximately 47,000 people in this country every single year who die by suicide. It was very difficult, it was very painful, uh, it was scary at times, but it that process of talking about what happened, it helped us heal. And uh, our journey's not over. Um, there are days that I feel like the strongest woman on the planet, and there are days that I feel just as fragile and weak uh, and vulnerable as I did the day of his death. I expect that I'll feel that way probably for the rest of my life. But I think that the blessing in our journey and what we've learned and continue to learn is that if it could happen to him, if it could happen to us, it truly can happen to anyone. And my children now and I put the maintenance of our mental health at the top of our list. The same way we go to our dentist, we check in regularly with a therapist. It doesn't have to be every week, it's not every week. If our whole society looked at mental health and wellness that way, like we look at our dentist, we'd be in a better place. Sometimes it's really hard to 
even look through pictures anymore. There's certain days I can do it, certain days it's a little bit tougher mm -hmm. uh, than others. And I have a great group of friends who are really good about um, seeing signs before they come and just kind of wrapping their arms around me. I miss my son. I just think something in his heart was so broke that in that moment, he didn't think the world was better off with him. And man, did we lose out. It matters what kids say to kids. It matters if you tell somebody that they don't matter, if they aren't worth anything, if they aren't loved. Because as adults, we believe that. So of course, a child is going to believe that. Saving lives matters. Telling people that they matter, matters. I think as parents, we're afraid to ask our kids, do you have thoughts of hurting yourself? If we could normalize this conversation to say, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay. It's okay if you're not okay. I'm here for you. And when somebody comes to tell you that they're not okay, you're probably not equipped to handle it. So go tell somebody. So how do we not miss that sign? Let's do it. Let's help. Let's hear. Lend a hand. If you know somebody else who is struggling, help them. And please don't be afraid to put your children or yourselves into therapy. It has such a negative stigma about it. Be honest about your own struggles. I think we, nothing happens to me. I would be honest about the struggles that you've gone through to somebody else because maybe they're afraid to tell you, but now if you just opened up, now they're not so afraid and everybody's more alike than we think. Be the village. California San Joaquin Valley has one of the highest percentages of adults and children with serious mental health illnesses. And experts agree, early prevention is crucial in staving off future issues. Recent studies show a third of mental health disorders develop by age 14 and about half by 18. And it's usually years later until help is sought. But when there's a lack of facilities to help them, what is a parent to do? You build it from the ground up. The Bear Cave came about because um, we, because we had a full-time school psychologist and we had a, a SPED para also to help, they focused a lot on our special education students, but having us full-time school psychologists, we could also go outside of just our special education students and help all of our students that were in need. And so the Bear Cave became an area, it didn't used to be in this room, it was on a different room of our campus. It was just where everything was centrally located so that they could access our para, our school psychologist, and then when we brought on a so, um, social worker as well. They needed a safe place where they could have fun and feel connected to adults and build trusting relationships. Not only that, they needed a place where they would have safe, structured socialization. And then if we determined that they needed uh, more services or, or um, skills, then we targeted those students with specific interventions. And they're the most malleable at this age group because they're not quite kids anymore. They're not quite young adults. And so they're stuck in between that middle zone where their bodies are maturing, their brains are maturing, and they're uh, in a social dynamic that's very unique in their lifetime. Uh, so we need to navigate, help them navigate through that process and uh, let them know that uh, relationships are critical and they could build trust here and so that um, if ever they encounter any difficulties they have prior success in the middle school age. Coming in here all the time and talking to Mr. Vang about personal stuff mm -hmm. and he's comforting me and telling me that it's gonna be okay. I felt like I was like an outcast like I didn't feel I belong at this school at, at all. I would like walk and then I get made fun of for like how I run to. And I just felt like weird about it ever since. I don't like running, I don't like dressing out PE. But now I do. Coming to the Bear Cave changed all that. Okay, your turn, I'll, I'll take the winner. 
Okay, is, is spamming bad? We've got some video games for boys. There's crafts kids can do. Um, so there's not a stigma of I need to get help from somebody. So if everybody's got access in here during lunchtime, we've got our social emotional support team in here to be able to be there for kids just self-referring themselves. When we first opened it, it was for our students with uh, significant emotional disturbance. And so when they were coming in here, um, there was stigma actually and so not a whole lot of kids wanted to come in here but they started seeing um, uh, building relationships with myself and our social emotional parent educators and so it became kind of like a cool spot for all kids um, and so they all started intermingling and our students with emotional disturbance started picking up skills by socializing with uh, all the other general education students um, and it became just um, a cultural kind of like a phenomenon. It's like okay for kids to say that they're, counsel they're getting counseling services now. Whereas before um, it was kind of, don't, don't call the kid's name out loud in the class, be a little more um, cognizant, just briefly do it to the side. Whereas now the kid is saying, oh yeah, no, no, I have got to go meet with Mr. Vang. I have to go meet with Ms. Melgarejo. This is our community room. So mm -hmm. when our kids come, they're usually here all day long. And so this is one of the spaces that they can come and just feel free to be themselves. So I grew up in Fresno, was born and raised, um, and then went away to college in San Diego and then graduate school in Los Angeles. And when I was um, getting some experience in San Diego and Los Angeles, was really exposed to a lot of different programs. The county had tons of programs, nonprofit programs existed to serve lots of different patient populations, for-profit agencies were all over serving different specialties. So coming back as a provider of mental health services was shocking to me that we had a town of a million people and that we had very few mental health resources. And so it was discouraging for me. I didn't like that feeling. Um, and I felt a sense that I needed to do something about it, that this is my community, this is where I grew up, and this is what I've been trained really well to do. So I needed to do something about it. And so almost four years ago, um, started a company called Sierra Meadows Behavioral Health and Ascend Behavioral Health to fill the gap in what we call the continuum of care. So the continuum is inpatient psych hospital on this side and outpatient therapist on this side. And that's all Fresno had and there was nothing in between. So this continuum of care was lacking. It had bookends, but nothing in the middle. And so the goal was to provide services throughout that continuum so that not just when somebody was in crisis and suicidal or not just when they were mildly depressed or self-harm, things like that, that we had services that would help them through that process of recovery. This is one of our um, group therapy rooms here where uh, we usually have anywhere between seven to ten teens at a time. So we provide the whole spectrum now of services in the middle. So we have a residential program where teens um, can go and live for up to 30 to 45 days and it it functions like an inpatient program in the sense that there's um, nursing staff and therapists and psychiatric staff on site with the kids 24 hours a day, but it's in a home setting where they can have sort of the comfort, um, but also the security to be able to, to do the work that they need to do um, to engage in their treatment. We have had, from like 13 years ago, we have had a significant drop in suspensions. Sometimes kids come and say, I'm having a conflict with somebody, and can we talk it out? And when that happens, we're so excited because then we can be proactive on it. It's very rewarding. Um, we just see, it's amazing when kids come in here with no friends, and they come in here making friends and just having a smile on their face and learning those valuable life skills. I blocked. Oh, did you win? Yeah, no, no, I won. You won? Yeah. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. Yeah, is, it, is this really good? Oh, we see huge changes. It's one of my favorites. Like, seeing an adult change is fantastic, but when you see a teen change, there's something that just lights up your face because you know that that kid has a whole future in front of them. They can take a road that can take them to some really tough places or dark places or scary or dangerous places in life, or they can take a path where they're gonna struggle, of course. Like a lot of our kids are gonna have recurring episodes of depression or they're gonna struggle with their anxiety again, but they're on a road towards uh, 
towards working on those things and towards working on themselves. And just to see sort of that physical transformation and, and seeing somebody sort of liven up and see sort of life come back into their eyes um, is a fantastic thing to watch. My childhood started in an incubator, right? I was in the hospital for about a month. My parents both used drugs. By the time I was in kindergarten, right, I got held back. I only knew how to talk Spanish. And I was really proud of my culture, right? I was raised by my grandparents. So I get into kindergarten, I'm like, I'm Mexican, I'm knowing how to talk Spanish, and all of a sudden, that's not a good thing. I start to have identity crisis. So then I thought that I was dumb, I wasn't good enough. And then I couldn't talk English that well. So then it was hard for me to start to assimilate. Then my dad was going to jail. My mom had mental health issues. And this one time, my mom and dad got in a fight. Me and my dad got into a big fist fight after that. My dad kicked me out and I ended up being homeless right at the age of 14. I, I got straight Fs that year, they kicked me out. I went to continuation, I got locked up into juvenile hall. So if I think about a flower, right, does it have the soil that's nourished, right, for it to grow as good as it can grow? Does it have the water? Does it have the light? Does it have all the different elements for it to be the healthiest flower that it can be? If not, then we might not have a flower, right, or it might not even bloom. It's that I didn't have the role models, I didn't have the environment, I didn't have the necessary element, the soil that I was talking about, to grow my mental health in. What I had was we were all living in the same soil, and the soil was rotten and we're all trying to grow in that rotten soil. Change can be difficult. Old processes and stigma still get in the way of people getting the mental health services they desperately need. But how can we cultivate change? Sometimes it takes people who have experienced the pain to inspire change in others. All right, if you can hear me clap once, if you can hear me clap twice. All right, thank you so much. Today, what we thought about for our objectives is that we want to start to just analyze what it means to have a school-based mental health system. My name is Felipe Mercado, and I'm an assistant professor at the social work department at Fresno State. I teach an integrated practice a class as well as qualitative research. In my integrated practices class, we're really starting to look at all the different systems that are here in Fresno County and seeing do they communicate to each other. And so we start to see that so social workers work in silos. How do we get them to start to work in, in collaboration with the well-being of a family or a group or an individual in between their conversation, so to speak? Fresno County Sheriff's deputies say this property is where 16-year-old Sammy Mercado's friends last saw him. Two men ran out of a hut and began shooting at the car and Mercado. I was a principal, I was a teacher, and I was in the doctor's program. And it was because my little brother had got shot and murdered and he was missing for six months. So for me, I got really busy because the more that I got busy, the less I had to look at that. And it wasn't until about two years after my brother's body was found that I started seeing a therapist. And I remember going home that night and just starting to cry. And I hadn't cried probably like since I was a young kid. And I just started, and I couldn't stop crying. Like it was just like, like you put on the water hose and like nobody turns it off, right? And I was, and I wanted to stop crying because like everything in my psychology was telling me I need to stop crying because I'm just male and I'm supposed to be tough. But I had just broken. And as I started crying, it all of a sudden, you know, I started, I started to realize I was grieving. As I started grieving, right, I started to feel like this burden, this lift come out. And that's when I started to realize, you know, even when I was talking about my brother's story and talking about trauma, but I wasn't talking about the healing because I didn't know how to heal yet. So here, I was, here I'm starting to kind of start to get into the infancy of like, this is what healing looks like. Not because I read it in a book, because I've actually felt it. When you think about, you know, your position as a social worker and you think about community service, Think about a social worker that's offering community, right? Different types of, you know, community outreach, right? Having cultural, uh, cultural specialty. A lot of my students want to diagnose, diagnose. So I, I want our, st our, our students, right, to, to leave and to really understand how do we know what an individual has went through? 
that God has got him or her into my office. Everyone talks about trauma, but they're actually saying, you know what, if we're, if we're talking about trauma, why are we diagnosing somebody if it's their trauma? Right, if it's their trauma, then we have to undo their, their trauma. We have to see if this stuff works first before we start to, to diagnose them. And as I start to know these things, right, how do I start to call on other different services so we can provide the support that they need? Because we can't do this in silos. Mental health cannot be done in a silo. I can't call in an individual, diagnose them, give them some pills, and expect for them to get better. We need a community. We are at the beginning of a major turning point as a culture, that we are building our awareness about the attitudes that we have towards mental illness, mental health, and that we are ready to make a change for the better in terms of those attitudes. We need to kind of shift our mindset around what we think is possible for people with mental health conditions because recovery is possible. If we equip young people with the skills to build their resiliency in a way that is culturally responsive and appropriate to them in their unique cultural circumstances, and in a way that helps them to appreciate their strengths and build on their strengths, we can stave off um, generations of hurting. So if a person is able to experience prevention then we may not see the post-traumatic stress disorder even though there was a traumatic event. That means prioritizing our mental health and wellness, uh, which needs to start from early childhood, and then it needs to go on in the home, in the workplace, in our communities, uh, in our society, in our social lives. Uh, we need to really cast a broad net and make it okay to talk about our mental health and mental illness. And it needs to be a priority just as we are so accustomed to thinking of uh, fitness and weight management as a priority. Don't miss opportunities to talk to a loved one, especially a teen. Even if it's just a phase, even if it's just something that they're going through, don't miss an opportunity to ask questions and to be curious. Wondering with somebody without judgment, without needing to label, without needing to fix them, but just asking questions with an open-ended posture, without feeling like things need to be different than they are, but just trying to understand people, I think goes a long way in helping these conversations. Did you guys get bracelets? You want one? You got one? Tell somebody they matter today, help them out. Welcome to school. Have a happy Friday. What would you say to your 14 year old self? Find who you are and to love yourself for who you are, despite what society says. So no matter what society says, your teacher, your mom, right? Like, know that you're valuable in this life and know that no matter what, right? If everything that you're going through right now, if you can figure out a way to see the light at the end of the tunnel, it might seem like a curse, but it, it's gonna be a gift. And I would also say that if you find someone you connect to and you have a relationship with, an adult that's positive, try, give them a try and being able to talk their truth to somebody that they feel comfortable doing that with. Fears have been chasing you down And the stars seem to be falling Closer to the ground So see, we're eating burritos. She made them and she brought <laughs> fruit too, look. She brought everything. Look at them, both of them smiling. Yeah, they were very proud, for sure. After my parents passed away, you know, running became a different meaning for me. It was not just exercise, but it was therapy for me. It allowed me to get rid of all that pain, you know, pounding the pavement, you know, clear my thoughts. So it was good physically, but more for my mental health at that time. And for all these last seven years, it has been. Morning. My, my wife and I, we joke around a lot and stuff. Uh, she's very supportive. She's the one that kicks me in the butt, you know? 
and and she makes me realize and it's true you know you gotta enjoy your days because you never know what's gonna happen been in the eye of every hurricane and it feels like the night in the light of day and you tell yourself you can I stopped two years ago because I had to stop and look at Christine and uh, to see what that meant so that I could heal. It was so hard when I started to do this and to put my story out there and there was so much backlash. And what if you put it out there? What if you put the thoughts in my kids' head by doing what you do? And to see that that's actually not what happens and to hear the professionals and say, talk about it and to tell and to see these kids reacting to it, it's worth it. Every heartache, every negative criticism, everything I've ever done, every banging my head against a wall trying to get through, today was like eye-opening to where it can happen. If you keep just talking about it, it's going to save lives. Even when the stigma is so hard, push past it because the lives are worth it. The stigma is breaking. I'm encouraged to see that on a campus, the stigma is breaking.